Throughout today's lecture, we're going to start to try and define what information architecture is and contextualize why it's needed. IA means different things to different people, and in some ways it's used as a catch-all term for other concepts such as UX, systems design, documentation, etc. The overall goal of this class is to get you thinking about how you might organize information on a website, so don't focus too much on the, on the specific definitions that we're going to go through. As I said, lots of different people define information architecture in different ways. And while this course is going to focus on IA mostly from a website design perspective, much of what we cover in this class could also apply to mobile websites, uh, mobile apps, or even perhaps uh, desktop applications. Most of what we're going to cover today is described in further detail in the Information Architecture for the Web and Beyond book. Um, and this specific lecture is mostly going to be covered in chapter one and two of this book. Um, throughout the, the time in the class, I'm going to refer to this book as the, uh, the Polar Bear book. The Polar Bear book starts with a great example of how interactions with information can change over time. It introduces us to Marla and her son Mario. Marla has an, ex an extensive record collection. When she wants to listen to some music, she has to go over to her meticulously organized shelves, which are organized alphabetically. When she wants to listen to the Beatles, she goes over to the B section and finds it quite quickly. Marla's record collection is an example of a one-to-one -one relationship with the information artifacts, artifacts that she has. She has only one copy of the record. If she wants to listen to that album somewhere, she needs to physically find it. Because she has only one physical copy of each album, Marla must define one way to organize it. She only has one way to play it sequentially, so she has to start the record from the beginning and then continue on throughout the, that particular side. She could perhaps start it from you know, the middle or the side, but it always has to go from, from sequentially. She has organized her records alphabetically, but what are some other ways she could organize them? Perhaps by genre maybe by release date. Some people even organize their records by color, as you can see here in the uh, photo on the slide, for a more aesthetic look. Whatever her organization process, each method could present its own set of challenges. For example, what do you do with a compilation art uh, album with various artists? Do you perhaps organize it by the title of the record, so in this case in the W section for Woodstock, or maybe you would put it under V for various artists. Similarly, if she was going to organize her record collection by genre, what do you do with a record that is hard to classify? So in the case of this Herbie Hancock record, you might think it would be classified as jazz, but perhaps somebody else might classify it as funk or soul music. So you can see, depending on what the one organizational method that she chooses, she may be faced with different challenges, and she may you know, face some questions about how she would classify each album. And in a given day, for example, she may be more interested in finding a specific record, but she also may wake up one afternoon and want to, one morning perhaps, and want to listen to music from, you know, from a particular genre like jazz or country. And she would have to search through her alphabetically organized uh, set of records to specifically find records on that genre. So each, each organizational technique presents its challenges and with this one-to-one -one relationship she is stuck with one specific measure of organizing. So let's now talk about Marla's son Mario. His music collection is entirely CDs. Like records, CDs are a physical format, but unlike records, CDs are digital rather than analog. This allows him to play music in any order that he wants, or if he had a 5 CD changer, he could randomly play an assortment of albums. Despite the digital nature of these CDs, he still has some of the same organizational challenges of his mom. His CD collection is still contained in physical devices, and he's still forced to, to choose one method on how he might organize his music collection. It's still His CD collection still has that same one-to-one -one relationship that his mother has. But then in 2001, Mario got an iMac. The ads for the iMac invited him to rip, mix, burn his music. And you can see it specifically from the ad. It, it's, you know, it's encouraging its users to uh, you know, rip their CDs, make copies of it. So you can see 
you know, he's got a whole bunch of different mixes depending on what music uh, genre or what he is doing here. So you can see there's a workout CD, there's a party mix, there's a road chip CD. The music ripped to his iMac would arguably sound just as good as his CDs, but once on his computer, he could listen to it in any way he pleased. He could make copies, share it with his friends, he could organize it how he liked and could change that organizational system on the fly. He could make playlists, burn new albums to CDs. He was no longer constrained to that one-to-one -one relationship with music that he had when he was without his iMac and just was with his physical copy of the CD. In the case of, his, of Mario and his iMac, this was all made possible because of iTunes. Mario was no longer constrained by this one-to-one -one relationship with his music, and iTunes afforded that ability. So here's, a, here's what iTunes looked like in its very early days. In its earliest and simple forms, iTunes allowed Mario to organize his musical collection in a dynamic way, which was challenging before he digitized his music collection iTunes serves also as an interesting example of the evolution of a piece of software and provides another compelling lesson in, uh, regarding organizing information. Over time, iTunes evolved from being a piece of software that had just allowed users to organize their music library. In 2003, for example, Apple introduced the iTunes Store, which allowed users like Mario to buy music and individual tracks without ever owning a copy of the physical album. Shortly thereafter, I, the iTunes store started selling TV shows, then music, and each section within that store has had its own separate categorization scheme. Music, for example, was organized under you know, rock, alter, alternative, pop, hip-hop, etc. Uh, movies, television shows, were organized under, for example, family, comedy, action. As listed in Chapter 1 of the Polar Bear book, iTunes was no longer where Mario just organized his CD collection. It was where he went to to buy and rent and watch TV shows, to buy and rent movies, to preview and buy music, to buy applications for his iPod, to search for and listen to podcasts, to browse and subscribe to iTunes U University courses, to listen to streaming radio stations, to listen to audiobooks, and to browse and listen to music shared by others in his household. All of these categories added a complexity to a product that used to be relatively simple and presented unique information organizational challenges. If you look at the interface here, this is, I believe, uh, the uh, iTunes interface in 2010, you can see it's far more cluttered than our earlier version. So if you go back to our earlier version, you can very much see that it's, it's Mario's music library, a little bit of a radio tuner, and nothing else. But if you skip through a few years, you can easily see how all of the different sections that are now presented to Mario. So you have music, movies, TV show, podcasts. This is the iTunes U section. Also a whole section for books and apps and radio as well. So if you compare again, compare the two interfaces, when it first uh, started, iTunes was relatively simple, but only several years later, it was quite complex. All of these categories added a complexity to a product that used to be relatively simple and presented unique or information organization challenges. For example, iTunes always had a search box, but now search functionality was spread across all of these categories and, and was challenging. For example, what happened when you entered Dazed and Confused? Did that refer to the movie? Or did that refer to the soundtrack to the movie? Or perhaps the original Led Zeppelin song or one of the countless covers of it? Going back to our friend Mario, when he first bought his iPhone, he was surprised to find that the functionality that was all confined to iTunes on his Mac was now separated into distinct apps on his iPhone. He listened to music in the music app. There wasn't a TV show or movies app. It was all found in the videos app. Confusingly, the music that Mario, confusingly, the video, the video that Mario shot with the phone itself were not in videos. They ended up in the photos app. The only mention of iTunes was the iTunes Store, where he could buy TV, music, and movies. Mario had bought Apple products because of their reputation for excellent design, but he found that managing his media across a Mac and his iPhone was incoherent and confusing. We can see from Mario's experience that he was facing two common problems confronted by information architecture. 
One, over time, his simple software tool had become very complex with many features and organizational schemes. And two, the software tool was now available across many different devices, each with its own way of organizing and presenting information. His experience with his information was dramatically different on his desktop computer, his smartphone, his Apple TV, his Apple, his Apple Watch, or CarPlay. One of the concepts at play with our poor friend Mario is the concept of information overload. In its, in its latter stages of development, iTunes presented Mario with too much information. It is no longer just his 40 CD music collection. The content available to Mario consists of millions of TV shows, movies, and albums. In its basic terms, information overloads means being presented too much information that our minds don't know how to comprehend with and deal with all of the content. It's not a new term, but it, was really, it has really come into its own with the advent of the internet. As I, mentioned, it, as I mentioned, information overload is not new. Technological advances such as the telegraph, telephone, radio, and television all presented audiences with far more information than previously available. It is important to note, however, that almost every one of these information advances has led to the creation of new technologies to help organize and make sense of that information. For example, the creation of the movable type printing press in the 15th century led to the eventual creation of encyclopedias, alphabetic in indexes, and public libraries to allow people to better manage and make more sense of these new information sources. The second concept that is introduced by Mario's iTunes experience is that of information decoupling. Let's break down what that means. As, Mar as Marla's LPs and even Mario's CD collection showed us, there was a time when information had a tightly coupled relationship with the artifact that contained that information. Marla's music was contained on her physical records. Literature was confined to physical books. The container, in this case the book, the record, and to a lesser degree the CD, and the information, be the music and the literature, were tied together after manufacturing. But a, bush, uh, but a push towards digital changed all that. Ebooks are not constrained to one container. A Kindle can hold many different books and you can easily remove and add them. Particularly in, in a non-content rights managed environment or a cloud-based desktop setup, that same copy of your ebook could exist on your phone, your tablet, and your desktop computer. What, are, what we are seeing here is content being decoupled, not only from the artifact that contains it, but also the context from which we access it. So to summarize this and Mario's general challenge, we are both dealing with more information and having to understand and organize it in far more different contexts. Part of Mario's confusions comes from the fact that the software is often originally designed to solve very specific problems, and the successful ones outgrow their problem set boundaries to encompass more and more functionality over time and lose clarity and simplicity. We see from iTunes, it starts as a music organizational tool on personal computers and grows to a media platform that entails multiple formats, content types, and, and is available on different devices. Let's look at the evolution of iTunes a little more closely, and I really like doing that with this website versionmuseum.com. As you scroll through it, you can see that they do uh, this type of treatment for a whole bunch of different platforms. And so we're going to focus on, uh, obviously, iTunes, but if you'd like to see how Facebook has changed over time, or Google, or even some news websites such as the BBC, or some retail sites like Amazon, it's a really good kind of repository of the changes of the, these sites over time. And when you're thinking about information architecture, it's, it's really great to use these, these examples. And there's a whole slew of them. And it's an interesting example of how a lot of these sites um, have added functionality over time and you know, have probably had to consider information architecture more because as more functionality is added to these sites, how you organize the information that it presents becomes a, a more uh, complex challenge. So again, that website is versionmuseum.com. So we're going to start off, and maybe we'll make it a little larger so we can see a bit bigger on our screen, uh, by going through iTunes. So iTunes started in 2001, and this site chronicles it up until about 2015. So you can see how, uh, you know, the lo starting off, you can see how the logo has uh, evolved over time. So even though iTunes does a lot of things, particularly in its current uh, formation, its logo uh, has always centralized and represented music. 
Although it's interesting, you can see here in the early formations that the CD is a significant part of it. And so from 2000 up until 2006, you can see that the logo is has the CD in the background. And so it really shows its original roots. Its original roots are were as a platform that helped you organize your music collection. So like Mario, you would grab your CD, put it into your iMac, rip it, and then it would live on your your desktop computer. And then that would open up that whole, you know, one to many relationship with your music collection. You could then, you know, organize music any way you wanted to. You could do it by genre, you could do it by alphabetical, you could do it by date. And so iTunes, its first inclination was very much about the CD ripping, and you can see it from its very logo. And it's interesting to see as it's changed. And so in 2010, you're starting to get more functionality. And we'll see that as we go through the iterations, but you can see it even from their logo that they've moved away from being strictly a CD ripping program to a more media platform. So music's still the central part of it, but it does so much more. So let's roll through here. So this is 2001, and some of these images are a little bit pixelated, but you can see 2001, the, the platform, the, the, the software is very, very simple. It's essentially a tool for um, organizing your records, and so organizing your CDs specifically. Um, so you can see that in the case of this user, they have you know, ripped in probably records or CDs again, sorry, from Radiohead, U2, um, some music from the 80s from AHA, and it's a very simple interface. So it has you know, your library, a radio tuner, or some playlists you created, but not a lot. It has a search, plat you know, search uh, functionality as well, but beyond your music, there isn't much there. So this is, this is basically it at, uh, uh, at launch. And you can see you can organize by song, you can organize by artist, you can organize by album, and even genre as well. And I believe the way that it would get these genres was from central databases that, you know, for example, in the case of this White Stripe album, this, it would, you know, when you ripped it into your CD player, it would recognize that the record was the White Stripes. Uh, it would get all the song names from a central repository and that genre, uh, those genres uh, would also be grabbed from that central repository. So you can see 2001, pretty simple. It had some visualization techniques, but it's very much about, um, you know, playing your music and organizing your music collection. 2001, I guess this is the second version of iTunes. This is the iTunes on a Macintosh, I believe. I think the thing they added in this version was... Uh, being able to interface with your early versions of iPods. So still a pretty simple, I guess there was an equalizer added. Uh, so in 2002, you can see some of the functionality of the software growing a bit. So as it says here, it's added audiobook support. So all of a sudden you have a little bit more information here. Not, not, a, not very different from its earlier versions. It's only two years old, but you can start to see the creep of some of the functionality. 2003, 2005 is where you see you start to see a real bigger bigger change, and so that was the introduction of the wind out of the music store, uh, and also podcasts. Um, and I guess for the first time, iTunes uh, 4 was also available for a Windows uh, uh, PC as well. So the interface is still relatively similar, but you can start to see, especially in the source section more items being added. So now there's a music store. It still has the radio, still has the library, still relatively simple, but we've moved beyond the software being just a collection of your records. You can now bring physical music into it without ever having any, you know, you know, CD for that thing. You know, as you can start to see the interface is getting a little bit busier. Um, still similar ways to organize your, your content, so genre, artist, albums. But now you're essentially bringing in records from uh, outside sources. And here, you know, for example, here's the music store. So if you look at the music store, uh, again, this is still in 2003. This is the fourth version of iTunes. The interface has changed a lot. So when you get to the store functionality of iTunes, you know, this main interface in the middle here is significantly different than it was before. So, you know, you're presented with promos for new records, it's top songs, it's, uh, you know, featured artists. You can also do it by genre, some new releases. And so it's become busier. And this, this interface here for the store is significantly different from this interface here, which is your music library. And if you look at it as a whole, you know, the simplicity that existed in earlier versions 
is starting to change. It's, it's getting more complex depending on which one of these sources you choose. So, you know, in the case of Mario, he's now presented with a whole bunch more uh, functionality than he would have been before in its very simple format. So you can buy your records. Uh, you know, so there's a, here's a promo page for a specific artist. So again, each one of these sections of this, this the iTunes uh, player has its own look and feel and way of organizing information. So if we keep scrolling through, you know, podcasts also have been added. I believe in this stage, yeah, the podcasts were still through the music store. So if you wanted to subscribe to them, you would, you know, go to the music store and go to the podcast section, as you can kind of see here, there's some breadcrumbs. And we'll, we'll uh, in later lectures, we'll start looking at how navigation tools help us, uh, you know, when we get to the situation where we're presented with a lot more information. And so you can start to see a little bit of that in the iTunes version in this 2005 version where, you know, with all of this information, they're using a, you know, a type of breadcrumb system to make it a little bit easier to use. So at least to, to you have more of a sense of where you are within this larger platform. And we'll go through some of those navigational aids later on in the semester. So yeah, we, you can start seeing iTunes 5. Um, not too much here. It seems to be, it even says here it was the shortest version. Uh, it doesn't seem to be, I guess, some simple UI changes, but not too much as far as new functionality. But let's scroll through. So here, iTunes 6. So now television shows are for sale. Uh, so the iTunes store expanded to television shows. It has the same similar look a little bit to the the you know, the music uh, uh, presented, where do we go down? Here we go. So I'm just trying to find where uh, an example of, yeah, so here are some videos you can look. So, so it's now not just a music player, it's a video player as well. Um, I'm trying to scroll through here. So yeah, iTunes 7, movies for sale. So again, if you look through this interface, it's, it's a whole bunch of different things. And your library is now organized by specific, you know, types of content. So music, movies, TV shows, podcasts, radios, the iTunes store is a little bit separate. Um, and the iTunes store gives you more than just uh, music now. Obviously, you can see here music, movies, TV shows, audiobooks, podcasts. And so I think at this stage around 2006, you're really starting to see the creep of features and content. And, you know, to a, a user like Mario who had it in his early stages and just was using it to organize a CD collection, it's, it's, it might be challenging to, uh, to kind of comprehend all of this. You know, if he wants to find his, just his, you know, CD collections, his favorite CDs, he now has to kind of sort through a whole bunch more content. Um, and this is only, you know, five years after it was first introduced. So if we keep scrolling, they, they eventually in, in, in 2008, the iTunes also becomes the spot where you, uh, you know, kind of purchase and organize your apps for your mobile devices. And so not only is it, um, you know, where you would do your music and your media, it is now your interface with your digital devices as well. So you can really, really start to see the, the platform creep at this point and the interface just keeps getting busier and busier as you scroll through. So this is an app, obviously, iTunes 8. Um, not much as far as changes as we scroll through. I don't want to spend too much on this, but again, iTunes 9. Uh, again, the, the content's gotten a little bit cleaner in the left-hand side, but still a lot of capabilities here. It seems like they've maybe streamlined the iTunes store a little bit. Um, let's just scroll to its last iteration, um, Ping. I'm not sure what Ping is. I think it was a way to allow uh, your friends to share music with one another. So again, this this platform goes beyond just a music and media platform and a way to, um, you know, uh, buy content. It has now got some of the aspects of a social network as well. And so it's, you know, iTunes at this point is becoming somewhat bloated. Uh, you can see again, look at all of the options here. So music, movies, TV shows, podcasts, the university courses, uh, books, apps, radio. You got the store, you got the ping social network. Uh, and then, you know, you have all your playlists and iTunes does all of this for you. Um, so let's scroll through and this is, we'll kind of finish off here that, 
again, it, like just a big takeaway from all of this is that you can see that, you know, uh, the function creep with iTunes added so much complexity that it really took too much and it, 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 you, you will now have to deal what, with what is called information overload. And so it you know, has your music, your TV, your everything. And it's, it's, as a user, it's confusing and you really need to have a great information architecture to make something like this, which has so much functionality, easier to use and easier to navigate. You can see a little bit as you scroll through here as well that when they get to the 12th version, which I think is pretty close to now, they're actually starting to remove functionality. So, you know, the App Store was removed in iTunes 12. Maybe that was a little bit of a backlash to what it's all done. And from my rough understanding, I believe they're actually uh, doing away with iTunes in 2020. So it must have been sometime this year. Um, and again, I would suspect that part of it is because it's become too big of a beast. And a lot of that functionality that used to exist in these, all in this iTunes app, has now been separated into different apps, which I think would make it more navigable for, um, for users. So again, check this site out. It's, it's a really cool site, versionmuseum.com. I'll, I'll throw a link up uh, somewhere on our, our, uh, our course page and uh, take a look for yourself about how you know a system changes over time so again if we start from the beginning you know itunes in its simplest form just a cd player uh, cd ripper and music player and then when you get to the kind of some of the final or more final busy platforms it does a whole bunch of things so what does all this have to do with information architecture this quote from the polar bear book sums it up really well what is needed is a systematic, comprehensive, holistic approach to structuring information in a way that makes it easy to find and understand, regardless of the context, channel, or medium the user employs to access it. Information architecture partially focuses on thinking about information in abstract ways, so that when someone like Mario is presented with a common and understandable experience across platforms and devices, one way you do this is by striving for coherence across channels. So that, that means if a person is using a platform, how you use it should be similar across devices. For example, a bank website should have the same look and feel across a mobile device as it does on a desktop browser. The user experiences across these channels should feel consistent and similar. So let's look at an example of digital coherence by going through some of the digital properties of CBC News. So we're going to look at the CBC News website on a desktop computer, a mobile device, and we're also going to look at their CBC News app. And we're going to compare the different experiences to see examples of some of that coherence and even maybe a few uh, spots where they perhaps could do a little bit better. So here we have the CBC News website and the CBC News uh, mobile app as mirrored through my, my mobile phone. And you can see here that these both versions of the CBC News site are presenting a lot of information. Um, you can, you know, you can look at each of these examples and see that because of the vast amount of, org uh, of information, the CBC site has had to organize it by topics. And so for example, you have topics of, you know, local news area. So each one of the regions where the CBC has a uh, location has its own subsection. Um, going back to that main homepage, you can also see the news sorted by uh, subject type as well. So for example, opinion, world, Canada, politics, if you click on this little navigation item here, there's a few more. So indigenous, business, health, entertainment. And then the site itself presents you with a lot of information. So this here is a main section of news, mostly related to stories on the coronavirus and COVID-19. And if you scroll through, you can, you can see that the CBC News site presents you, this is the main index sites, presents you with a lot of information. And that's not particularly surprising. I mean, people come to the CBC News website for a lot of different reasons. Um, and one of those big reasons is to get up to date on what is happening right now. 
And because users come for a variety of different reasons, the CBC needs to present people with a lot of information at a given time. So this page is, is pretty busy, but as we'll see, and we're gonna do an example a little bit later on in the lecture where we compare the CBC to another uh, news organization website, um, but you can, uh, where they have a little less content that you'll see that you know, different journalism organizations with a different journalism focus may present their content in a different way because of the, the different nature of, you know, CBC is a breaking news site, but if you were, for example, a magazine which doesn't focus on breaking news, you would probably organize your information differently. But going back to the CBC site and its different platforms, if you compare it over to the mobile app, you can see some commonality between the two experiences. And so, for example, the, you know, the information is kind of presented in the same way and that the main story is the first thing you see. So if you look here on the left with the website, you'll see that this story related to the BC Health Authority spending money on masks that were proven to be ineffective is the main story on both the news uh, website, the desktop website, and the mobile app version. And if you scroll through, you see on the mobile app, that is, you see, again, some of those supplementary stories are there. Um, again, if you look at the navigation a bit, you can see a similar way of organizing it. So the if you click on the sections here, those same sections that are visible on the nav bar and through this little more section are also visible on the app. If you click on the local, um, it's a little different, uh, but if you click on the local, uh, you get a uh, an opportunity to see local stories. And so you, you can see through this as well, part of the differences between the two experiences as well. Like if you were a regular web user, you may have clicked on local on the app and assume that you would have seen a list of all of the different locations. Um, where when you know when you go to the app, you click on local, it's asking you to select the region where you're in, where you where you are perhaps, or at least a region that you're interested in. And that, uh, you know, th so those experiences are different, but I think those experiences are dictated by the device. And so, you know, on a, on a mobile app experience, you're, you may, for example, want to focus just on news about your city. So it would make sense that you would have to select your region. And I mean, some of that functionality also uh, exists on the website as well. I mean, I'm not in Ottawa, but you can see that I believe the site assumes that I'm in Ottawa. Um, and, you know, if, if that was true, the Ottawa information is what I would see first. And you would probably have that almost that same experience here on your desktop as you would on the mobile, mobile app. But overall, similar looks and feels. And you can see that there is a bit of a coherence between your experience on the uh, you know, desktop version of the CBC News site compared to the mobile version of the CBC News site. It isn't a complete departure from one, uh, one uh, you know, uh, one kind of uh, organization of this information compared to the other. And you can see some of that same coherence when you go to the mobile version of the CBC News site. So what we're currently seeing over here is their mobile app, but if you were to go to their mobile website um, without using the app, so this is the mobile version of Chrome on Android, again, you see a similarity between both the uh, you know, the desktop version and the mobile website version, those are, there's a coherence between the two. And that similarity is, is much more closer than it is if you compare the app version and the mobile version. And so, you know, with this mobile website version, you can see that the, the sections m match up very closely with the sections on the, the desktop site. And you, um, again, the more section brings you through to almost the same, you know, extra sections. And so overall, I think the CBC does well with maintaining a, a you know, digital coherence between the various different ways that you can experience their information. And so if you were, you know, moving around, so for perhaps when you get to your, your office at the beginning of the day, you sit down and go uh, 
to view the CBC News on your office desktop computer, the experience would not be that different than if you were um, looking at the CBC waiting for the bus on your mobile phone. And so that kind of coherence, which is dictated by good information architecture practices, makes those, those uh, experiences similar and, use and usable. So let's try to focus in a bit more on a few definitions of what information architecture could be. The Polar Bear book lists four possible definitions. The structural design of shared information environments. The synthesis of organization, labeling, search, and navigation systems within digital, physical, and cross-channel ecosystems. The art and science of shaping information products and experiences to support usability, findability, and understanding. And, and a emerging discipline and community of practice focus on bringing principles of design and architecture to digital spaces. To frame these definitions, let's introduce three central considerations of information architecture, users, content, and context. This diagram gives us a sense of the interplay between these interrelated pieces of information architecture. So let's define these a little bit more. Regarding context, all websites exist within a certain organizational context. A retail store might be trying to sell more of a product. An NGO might want to raise awareness about campaigns. A business might have a dedicated web content person, it may not. They might host their own website on their own servers, or it could be farmed out to an outside company. Each company or organization might have different short and long-term goals. All of this will impact how you approach organizing content on a website. Now looking at content itself, this one I feel is pretty simple. It's all, in, it's all the documents, applications, services that make up your website. It's the text, graphic, videos that your site might offer. A few things though you might need to consider when thinking about content. One would be ownership. Who owns and creates the content that, uh, that lives on the website? Where does it come from? Is it, does it come from outside vendors? Do you create it themselves? Do the companies you're making the website for have the rights to uh, reproduce that content? Another thing to think about is format. How are you getting this information? Is it coming to you as M uh, PDFs, MP4s? How is your audience going to receive it? You also have to think about the structure. So is that data in a JSON format? Is it in an XML? How does your website receive this flow of information? You also need to think about the metadata. Is your, how is your information described and tagged, or is, it, or is it at all? How that done, is it consistent? How will the users interact with this metadata? Another important consideration is volume. How much data are we talking about? Are you, do you have thousands of records, millions, 10, 20? Another uh, piece to keep in mind is dynamism, which means how often does the site turn over? Is new content added every day, every hour, every week, rarely ever? The last and often most important piece is users. Who is going to be using the systems? How are they accessing it? What information do they want? So let's compare two sites to get a sense of how these considerations go, compare to one another. And let's stick with the field of journalism. So let's compare the CBC and the New Yorker. So going back to CBC News, the content of CBC News is news articles. Its uh, sections are organized by different content types. So this could be world, politics, uh, indigenous. There's a whole series of them. Also, its content publishes 24-7. It's always putting out new news as, as uh, stories happen to come in. It has a combination of video, photography, and text. When you think about CBC News in context, the CBC is a public broadcaster, uh, which gives it certain constraints compared to commercial broadcasters, and it has a Broadcasting Act uh, requirements. It does both television, video, internet. It is also on the radio. The CBC is a nonprofit organization, and while it does have commercials, making a profit isn't the main motivation of the service. And who are the CBC News's users? So they are users maybe perhaps looking for breaking news, um, and in many cases perhaps they're Canadians. It's a Canadian public broadcaster, so I imagine a vast majority of the CBC's audience is Canadians. So now compare that to The New Yorker. So what is The New Yorker known for? It's known for long form content. The New Yorker comes out in magazine form weekly and its content is mostly text. 
um, context-wise, The New Yorker is a for-profit magazine. It's on, owned by Condé Nast. Uh, it's a print magazine, at least in its original form, it's a print magazine. And unlike the CBC, its model is a paid subscription model, and it also sells as its uh, magazines at the newsstand. Its users perhaps are a little bit different than the CBC, so the users um, maybe are looking for more analysis and in-depth uh, analysis of everyday events. And perhaps people are not everyday visitors. The New Yorker is not known for covering and breaking news. So if you were, for example, a news user and looking for what is happening right now in the world, you may not go to the New Yorker. You would more likely go to the CBC because the CBC is a more mainstream news broadcaster. So let's compare the sites of the New Yorker and the CBC News website to see how some of these differences between users, context, and content manifest itself. So going back to the CBC News website, you'll, as we already talked about, see that it has a lot of content. It has locations across the country. Um, it is trying to get people, a lot of Canadians with a lot of different information needs, up to speed on a lot of information. Their, um, you know, the, the rate that they create content is, is quite high. There's probably hundreds of stories created and added to the CBC News site every day. And you can really see it by scrolling through the site. The, the, this Just on this index page, we're probably presented about uh, 50 different stories. And a lot of focus of their page is, you know, how you navigate all of this information to a user. And so it has a lot of focus on the sections, as we've seen, uh, uh, you know, different sections that allow a user to kind of drill down on a specific type of content. Um, it also features something. So, you know, we see this main section here features the main story, and that allows kind of the user to both be presented a lot of information, but also to highlight something that is particularly popular or important editorially right now. Um, there's also a, a pretty big emphasis on letting you know the age of stories as well. So as I mentioned, I think more so than The New Yorker, I think CBC, people go to CBC News to get up to date on what is going on. And so when they see their stories, they want to have a sense of, of how old the story is or when it was created. And so you can see in the kind of way that information is presented on the CBC News site, there is always a kind of reference for the time. So this one hour ago story gives you a sense that it was, you know, it was created recently. And even, for example, the story related to Christia Freeland was 11 minutes ago. And so if you were scanning through trying to get more up to date on what has happened recently, you would perhaps look at these time pieces to have a sense of, you know, oh yes, this is brand new news. And so if you were re revisiting the CBC throughout the day, because it's, you know, a lot of its audience, its users are focused on breaking news, getting up to date, you would probably look for this information a bit more than you would for a story from The New Yorker. Uh, it also really tries to highlight content that is popular now. And I think part of that, again, has to do with the amount of information that the CBC has. And so, for example, it, you know, when we, when we think about dynamism, um, content and dynamism and volume, there's a lot of content on the CBC. And so it can sometimes be challenging to weave through it all. So features like this, you know, popular now section allow us to get a better sense of, you know, something that we may miss, um, you know, we can see what the larger base of people are reading right now. And I think that is particularly important in the case of a, uh, you know, CBC, um, you know, and that goes back again to its content and also that its users, you know, who might be using it, why they might be using it. So even though both of these sites are s s focused on journalism, um, you can see that there is a bit of a different interplay of content, context, and users um, that results in a different way of, you know, organizing the information on these sites. And so if we visit The New Yorker, um, you know, as we mentioned, The New Yorker is a, you know, monthly magazine, you know, and, all, and not all of this content is necessarily from the magazine, but because, you know, its audience is different in that they're probably looking for you know, information with a bit more depth. They may not visit the site with a regularity that a person might visit the CBC News site. 
you know, its information is organized in a different way. And you can see just quickly scanning through the site, you can see that you're presented far less stories. And so where with the CBC site, we probably saw 50 to 60 pieces of information uh, with the New Yorker site, you're maybe seeing 20 or 30 and they take up, you know, a much more prominent amount of space. Let's, let's kind of look at them beside one another to, to, to take a, a little bit of a closer look. Um, so let's close this there a little bit so we see more. So you can see here, you know, we're seeing, so, even if you just look at above the fold, like when we first go to the site, uh, above the fold is an old newspaper term, above the, the fold of a newspaper, um, you can see that you see a lot more stories in a lot smaller space on the CBC site than you would on the New Yorker site. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and here we have one, two, three, four, maybe five. And particularly if you really start scrolling, you really start to see a lot more information on the CBC site. You might, as you scroll down on the New Yorker page, see a couple more stories, I think in this case maybe six, but in the case of the CBC you have, you know, probably 20 to 30. And again, this goes back to the users, what they use it for, and the content. Like the content of the CBC is probably creating significantly more amounts of it. And so how their main page is organized is different. I also find it compelling that, you know, because of this vast amount of information, the CBC is much more focused on organizing its content into um, uh, different topic-based sections. And you see some of that with the New Yorker, but not to the same degree. Like the CBC clearly has like sections on you know local, the national uh, opinion, world, and if you I think if you scroll out, you see more. So politics, indigenous, uh, where the New Yorker, it's not topic specific it's kind of more content type so there's a few topics news books and culture but then you get into you know more uh, content types like crossword video podcasts archives and i think again that goes back to the fact that the volume of content is smaller so they're focused more on content types where the cbc because it has so much content uh, has to organize it by subject and going back to the, the the time situation that we were talking about before, so again, I mentioned that the CBC is, uh, focuses a lot on breaking news, among other things. So there's a focus on time, on a lot of their pieces. There's you know every single story reference either has a date or an amount of time since the article has been published. You don't see that same type of reference of time on the New Yorker site. As a matter of fact, you, you would. You would really never know whether this story about Joni Mitchell is from, you know, maybe a week ago or was put up today. And I think, again, that goes back to the nature of The New Yorker being a magazine site, a magazine once a week in the case of The New Yorker. Their audience may, for example, not have the expectation of this content being new or that there be a high turn of uh, churn of content. So... As you can see from these two examples, I think good information architecture design takes into account all three of these circles of context, content, and users. Um, and in the case of the CBC, um, you know, we can see that the mix of those three circles is different uh, than it would be for the New Yorker. And you know, this can also change at different times as well. So perhaps at a certain point in a, an organization decides they want to reach audiences on a different platform and might, for example, uh, focus less on their, putting content on their website and more perhaps on social media sites. Or for example, maybe the CBC shifts to focusing on video rather than their written content. And then, you know, if that change might dictate different ways that information is presented. So, you know, if they were all of a sudden wanted to focus on video, maybe this main section of the page wouldn't highlight the five or six news articles, maybe it would have a big video player. So it's important to remember that context, content, and users can change over time and that the information architecture needs will change as well. So I hope with today's lecture, we have started, I guess, the process of understanding what information architecture is. 
As I've mentioned, information architecture means a lot of different things for a lot of different people, and I don't really want us to focus on one specific definition. I think as we proceed throughout the class, we're going to have a better understanding of how it will impact our work. You know, as we saw, a big part of, you know, our big considerations of information architecture are users, context, and content. And that is a big takeaway from today's lecture is that those three pieces interplay with one another and dictate a lot of how we will organize the information of our websites. I think a big takeaway from today was also that information systems change over time. And, you know, as, for example, more features get added or as systems get more complex, users may uh, find themselves having to deal with uh, issues of information overload. And I think as people who are concerned with information architecture, you know, our approaches uh, related to IA will help alleviate those uh, information overload uh, possibilities. And we'll learn throughout the class some techniques to kind of mitigate some of those concerns. I also want you to think about those relationships that we started with, with the story of Marla and Mario. And so, you know, Marla and her original kind of artifacts of, of records enjoyed a one-to-one -one relationship. But as content and information move to a more digital form, be that with Mario and his digitized music in iTunes or things like podcasts or even ebooks, that that relationship has moved to a one-to-many kind of situation. And so that means that the pieces of content are no longer tied to their physical artifact anymore. You, for example, see with ebooks that uh, the, you know, the actual content of the book is, is not connected to any particular thing anymore. It's, it's, it is, uh, can be on your tablet, it could be on your phone, you could look it on the web. So I want you to kind of think of all of those things when we're starting to um, kind of figure out how we might organize information.